It's Christmas Eve, and Charles stands in his basement at Wren Street, King's Cross, wrapping presents. The Beatles' Day Tripper is playing on the light programme. It's unusual for pop music to be broadcast on this frequency, but this, apparently, will be the Christmas number one. The Horowitz family doesn't celebrate Christmas, but this year it overlaps perfectly with Hanukkah, so Charles plans to take presents the following day. There'll be no Christmas tree, of course, nor any decorations, but it's impossible even for an Orthodox Jewish family completely to ignore the festivities when the entire country shuts down to eat too much and watch too much television. So, like most of their Christian neighbours, they'll have a big meal and watch the Queen's speech at three o'clock. That'll be followed by Billy Smart Circus, one of his parents' favourites. Charles finishes wrapping the last present and adds it to the pile and prepares to go out. He's one last chore to attend to before he can relax. Ten minutes later, he gets out of the half-empty tube at Mile End Station and walks to the junction of Eric Street. It's a cold, grey, drizzly afternoon. There are few pedestrians. However, the lights are on inside the regal billiard hall and two bouncers stand guard outside, blowing on their hands and shuffling from foot to foot. Charles recognises one of them. Merry Christmas, Chunky, he says. The man leans forward and squints at Charles in the fading light. My God, he says, ain't seen you in a while, Charlie. How's tricks? Fair to middling, replies Charles. OK, if I go in, Ronnie and Reggie are expecting me. Chunky and his colleague part to let Charles enter. He pushes open the door to find the bar surprisingly full. It's so busy that the fog of cigarette smoke makes it difficult to see to the end of the long building. Most of the billiard tables are occupied by players, but there's a score or more of other men lining the bar and a great deal of inebriated banter rings around the room. As Ronnie, as always, Ronnie Cray is in his armchair at the far end of the bar from which he can see the whole room. He wears a suit, its jacket hanging from the back of his chair, a white shirt with sleeves held up by steel elasticated cuffs a la croupio, and a tie slightly loosened. A bottle and a glass rest on the small coffee table before him and a dog lies at his feet apparently asleep despite the noise. He sees Charles hesitating at the door and beckons him over. As Charles approaches, he spots Reggie behind the bar, filling some glasses with spirits from the optics. The noise levels in the bar drop as the regulars notice a stranger, but soon pick up again as Ronnie indicates a spare chair to Charles and they realise that the newcomer is welcome. Been expecting you, he says. Drink? Scotch, yeah? No ice, splash of water. Thank you, replies Charles, sitting down. A drink appears over his shoulder, held up by Reggie. He takes it while the other, uh, while the other twin also draws up a chair. Cheers, says Ronnie. Lachaim, says Charles, raising his glass. Yeah, I'll drink to that, says Reggie. To life, especially not getting it. It wouldn't have been life, said Charles, not without the murders, but many years, certainly. Well, either way, you done good, Charlie. Thank you. So what now? What do you mean, what now? asked Ronnie. Charles studies the gangster's expression. There's a half smile and Ronnie looks relaxed, but there's also a challenge. You always said that one day you'd ask me to do you a favour and if I came through, we'd be quits. Yeah, that's true, replies Reggie. But the way we see it, you didn't just do us a favour, you did one, we did you one and all. You got that doctor off, ain't you? Isn't that what you wanted? I don't follow you, Reg. How did you help get her off? I was the barrister. We let you take your case first, didn't we? Kept Blackburn on the leash till you had your shot. Charles shakes his head. I don't see it that way. Yes, I needed her case to go first, but in winning, I made sure the cases against you were dropped. Your charges have been dropped, haven't they? They have, replies Ronnie. There you are. That's got to count for something. 
Reggie leans forward, his elbows on his knees. Of course it does, but it ain't enough. You've caused us no end of trouble over the last couple of years. Harry Robeson's still inside, ain't he? Last I heard. And I ain't forgotten that ducking you gave me in the Thames, says Ronnie, a spark of anger, anger lighting his eyes. Nearly drowned me, you did. And besides, intervenes Reggie, now that we've seen close up what you can do, it seems to us you're even more useful than we thought. Charles finishes his shot of whiskey, sighs and leans back in his chair. What do you want then? Money? I've got lots of money if you let me have those documents back. The twins both smile and shake their heads. Their expressions so similar, it's like looking in a trick mirror. Reggie prods Charles' nearest shoulder, hard. Horovitz, you've gotten away with more than anyone where we're concerned. Got to be some sort of Guinness record. So just be effing grateful you're not propping up the Hammersmith flyover. I see, says Charles. Good, says Reggie cheerfully. Thought you would. Want another drink before you go? Charles shakes his head and stands. Have a good Christmas, boys. Give my regards to Vi. He salutes, turns and leaves the billiard hall. Worth a try, he thinks. Thank <laughs> <laughs>